Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Tonight there is blood everywhere. It's in our liturgy, it is in our readings, it's in our hymns. Uh, blood everywhere maybe makes us a little bit squeamish or um, a little bit unsettled to have so much blood. Yet, tonight, as we remember our series theme of eyes on Jesus, as we look to Jesus, and specifically now look to the blood of Jesus, there's more than meets the eye, more than maybe just our eyes can see, in, with, and under the blood. We hear from the Word of God that God is about something more, more than meets the eyes. We're not talking about transformers here. Uh, we're talking about the salvation and the mercy of God. But our story starts first back in Passover time, and specifically with something else that maybe is a little bit more than meets the eyes. God is bringing judgment upon Israel. Now, if you've been in the Christian church for a long time, it's really easy in some senses to kind of just move right past this, but if we really settle in to what is going on here, it probably makes us a little squeamish too. Um, uh, I, we all, I think, as Christians, have a little bit of a pacifist mentality. Uh, we want peace. We want kindness. We want forgiveness. We want joy and uh, uh, reconciliation with one another. And so it kind of strikes us really strange this God comes with wrath. And he perpetrates judgment and death. Even on little children, every firstborn dies. And so even in this plague, there's a little bit more than meets the eyes. God is dealing specifically with idolatry. Ever since Genesis chapter 3, this has been your problem, it's been my problem, it's humanity's problem. Uh, we do not fear, love, and trust in God above all things. We make out of all kinds of gods for ourselves. Things that we are going to trust in, things that we love in, things that we devote ourselves to rather than to God. And probably first and foremost, it's me, myself, and I. And so because of that, Scripture is very clear, God will not be mocked. The wages of sin is death. Idolatry reigns, and because idolatry reigns, so does judgment. And so it isn't that God is executing his judgment just on Egypt, these innocent people. No, instead, God is exercising his judgment upon idolaters. Egyptians, Israelites, you, me, we are all idolaters. And whether it's a plague in Egypt or it's the, uh, my brother strangling me, as in Cain and Abel, or whether it's a pandemic, or cancer, or a car accident, or war, or maybe just dying of old age. We are idolaters. And therefore, what we deserve is sin, death, and everlasting condemnation. So there's a little bit more than maybe just meets the eyes. God bringing this wrath on Egypt. It is God's judgment against idolatry. And even we see in the midst of this wrath that God is pouring out this judgment, not just on Egypt or the firstborn. Uh, he says it's poured out on people and animals. I mean, that probably shakes us up a little bit too. What did they do? But then he says this, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. God is demonstrating his judgment towards idolatry. And then he says words that I think are very important. We see them over and over in scripture. He says, I am the Lord. Ever since Genesis 3, we forget that. Ever since 8 o'clock this morning when I woke up, I forget that. God says, I am the Lord. And whatever trials and persecution and struggles we face in this world is an opportunity for us to recognize our idolatry, to repent and say, not Levi's the Lord. God is the Lord. 
And so in the midst of this plague, God is demonstrating his judgment towards idolatry, this idolatry that reigns. I mean, even follow post-Exodus, God's people, even those that were saved, uh, fall into idolatry in the desert. They want to they go back to Egypt. Or you follow the history throughout the Old Testament. And one thing that is incredibly clear in the entire Old Testament, it comes up over and over and over again, idolatry, idolatry, idolatry. They do not confess and worship the Lord. They do not listen to Him. But there's something in, with, and under all this. Um, we find that the old, whole Old Testament is ultimately pointing to God's salvation in Jesus. And even in this text of the Passover, God comes to his people and says, even though you too are idolaters, I have provided a salvation for you. Instead of you dying, take a lamb. And did you catch it to every household? Uh, I hope this is the last time I do Monday, Thursday service without you here with me. Um, but I think this, this will be memorable as we think of what the Passover was. Every household was gathered together. Um, and some of you might be gathered with just yourself, but that doesn't mean you can't still remember the Passover. Every household was gathered in their home, and a sheep's blood was shed, and the blood was placed on the doorpost of the house, and the judgment of God fell on the Lamb. It died. But God's people, those idolatrous people, they were forgiven of their sins and then death passed over them. Pointing us ever towards God's salvation. Even the sacramental, sacramental, sacrificial system that God established throughout his Old Testament people after the Exodus was all connected with this idea that someone else died. Pointing to Christ and his blood and his salvation. And so when the family would gather for Passover, there was this wonderful point in Exodus chapter 12 where it talks about this ceremony and this monthly, or not monthly, this yearly gathering and remembering the Passover. And it would be the first month of the year. That seems strange to us too, where it turns... Uh, in January, right? The first month of the year, most important month to remember God's salvation. And it says, when your children ask you, now if you have a child with you today, or children, uh, I encourage you, uh, maybe uh, when the service is over today, uh, ask, well, what was that all about? Right? Why, why did Jesus celebrate the Passover? Why did he say, this is my body, this is my my blood. And so the family would gather in the household and they would remember God's salvation through the Lamb. And in the household, they would be taught year after year. They would know the liturgy by heart and they would know the importance of what God had done for them. And it ends with this verse then the people bowed down and they worshiped. And so we worship by remembering God who saves us. And so Jesus, in the midst of this Passover, gathers his disciples together, and they sacrifice a lamb, and they celebrate the feast, and they're going about things. There's been some strange things already. Jesus uh, washed their feet, uh, but now they're in the midst of a meal, and it says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, this all seems normal, so. They'd known this ever since they were little kids. Every year in their home, they would celebrate this. Everything has been the same, uh, other than the foot washing, <laughs> up until this moment. And then Jesus says, take it. This is my body. This is my body for you. And then he took the cup, and then, oh, all right, maybe he's getting back to normal again, right? He took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. But then he said, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. And he said to them, truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Now this may be the fourth or fifth time you've heard these words already tonight. Um, the words of institution. And Jesus takes in the midst of this meal and he teaches his disciples something very important. That the blood on the doorpost isn't really why God passed. 
pass by. It passed by because the blood on the doorpost was ultimately pointing to the salvation that would come through the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so God in Jesus is doing three things here. He is bringing final judgment for sin. And that doesn't mean we still don't have plagues and pandemics and cancer, right? But we understand now that our slavery isn't just slavery in Egypt. Our slavery is slavery to sin and death and the devil. And we have hope of life everlasting. And so God's final judgment poured out for the idolatry that you and I live in is going to pour out upon a lamb, upon Jesus. It's the night before he is crucified for you and for me. And there's more than meets the eye in this Passover meal, in this bread and wine. We now know, and it's a mystery to us, but we know by the power of God's word, Jesus, what Jesus says is what Jesus says. And he says, this bread is my body, and this wine is my blood, and it is given for you for the forgiveness of sin. And Jesus also takes this Passover and the whole Old Testament sacrificial system, and he tells us these are just prefigurements. These are types. This is an old covenant. And he establishes a new testament, a new covenant that is in his blood. For the blood of sheep could never take away your sins. But it was a type pointing to Christ who does take away our sins. And so this wonderful meal gives us the blessings of God. Now this wasn't probably easy for the disciples to make that move. Uh, we know that earlier in his ministry, he talked about eating his uh, flesh and drinking his blood. They were extremely confused. In John chapter 6, he says, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Now many disciples left Jesus at this time. And he asked his 12 disciples, right, will you leave too? And we know Peter's response. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal. And we see as he institutes now this Lord's Supper for you and for me, that he has now said, this is indeed right here, my body, right here, my blood, as an everlasting covenant with you. That often, as often as you eat it, and often as you drink it, in remembrance of him, you have the forgiveness of sin. And it was a hard move because they were taught in Leviticus 17, it says that I will set my face against any Israelite or any foreigner residing among them who eats blood. And I will cut them off from my people, for the life of a creature is in the blood, and I will give it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. See, now Jesus has brought these things together. It is his blood. And so as the Old Testament followers of God were not allowed to eat or drink blood, uh, now it is actually in the blood of Jesus that God says that is where the life is. And instead of forbidding you, he commands you. He requests you to take and eat, take and drink. The life is in the blood, the forgiveness of sins. For you and whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life so even tonight where there's maybe all kinds of threats of judgment all kinds of scary things bearing down on us uh, viruses and loneliness or whatever you're facing maybe the loss of a job right in the middle of this christ comes and there's more than meets the eyes. In the midst of this, he offers you his body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. And where there is forgiveness of sins, there is life and salvation. So maybe the kid asks you, what does this all mean? Or maybe if you're alone tonight, you just ask yourself, what does this all mean? It means that Jesus has come for you. His blood is shed for the life of the world. 
I may be an idolater and you may be an idolater, but he is the Lord. And we believe and trust in his salvation for you and for me. Amen. And may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding may it guard your hearts and your minds.